good afternoon everyone good afternoon and good evening actually i mean like there are several person here from several countries so welcome to the asian au higher education fair 2023 public lecture this week we'll talk about the discover the power of molecular biodesign with university of Skopje, sweden so on the behalf of EHAF team, we are glad that we have just wrapped up the Asian AU Higher Education that was held online last Saturday. We thank to all of you amazing participants. And right now, we are already setting our site for the 15th European Higher Education Fair 2023. I have Indonesia 2023 series will consist of online and on offline, on online and offline event. This event is a solution for you students to know more and be able to connect with your desired European universities and talk to them in person. So this is the date. Uh, you will mark your calendar and check our social media for further update. So before we go any further, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Akip Poapa. Uh, I am graduated from Bandung Institute of Technology in biology and biotechnology biotechnology major. I finished my degree doing uh, research on Musa Kuminata, or you may know it as banana. Uh, and then before we start, uh, I hope you guys all turn off your mic. It's probably already automatically muted. Uh, no cam required. Please write your question in Q&A box. If you have a question during the presentation, we will discuss them in the Q&A session. The Q&A session will take like 30 minutes, so you guys can ask, ask anything, ask as many things that you guys want to know from our, our, our speaker today. You can also raise your hand during Q&A session, and we will turn your mic on, and this meeting will be recorded. Uh, Next, today's agenda is this, the opening introduction that is currently running on, 7 to 17 to 17.10. And then the lecture session by University of Skopje, Sweden. The q and session will be 30 minutes and then the closing remarks. Uh, so without further ado, I will introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Maria Algerin. Dr. Maria Algerin has been a Senior has been teaching in Skopje University for more than 20 years since she finished her master's degree and continues to teach after she finished her PhD. Uh, Maria currently acts as the program director for Master in Molecular Biotechnology, University of Skopje, and also International Academic Coordinator for School of Bioscience. Maria has several publications focusing on plant genetic indices, such as quantitative detection of sclerotinia scler Sclerotherium, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Sclerotinia sclerotherium in air and oil seed rape leaf samples by KPCR. The manuscript is still in preparation. And then detection of ascospore release of sclerotinia sclerotherium with real time PCR, an important tool in understanding disease development in winter OSR. And then uh, the characterization of tDNA take genes of Arabidopsis thaliana that regulates GA metabolism and flowering time. So Maria is focusing his work, her works in genetic of plant and disease. In past, Maria has also managed to secure several fundings from Knowledge Foundation, accumulating to more than 3 million krona. So without further ado, uh, Maria, science is yours. Hey, uh, thank you, Akip, for that really nice presentation uh, of myself. Uh, I know that the Latin names are always difficult to, to pronounce. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm sorry, so no worries. I, I also struggle, struggle with that. Uh, I will just share my uh, screen now to show my presentation. Um, right. Are you able to see now? Yes. Yes, good. So uh, this is just the outline of what I'm planning to talk about today. So first I will talk a little bit about Sweden and the Swedish way of studying. And then I will uh, continue to talk specifically about the course that we are offering in our bachelor's program. 
called Molecular Biodesign 2, where the students are planning and performing a CRISPR-Cas9 uh, experiment. Uh, and uh, maybe the challenges maybe we have with that course and also our experience from that course. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about my research also, which I keep also uh, told you about is mainly about detection of plant pathogens that cause serious diseases in crops. Uh, and I'm using different molecular techniques in, in order to do so. so. Uh, and then I will just finish off by telling you a little bit more about our university, the programs we are offering at our, um, at our department, which is the School of Bioscience. Okay, so I don't know if you uh, know anything about Sweden, but it's actually situated here in the um, northern part of Europe. Uh, it's actually the fifth largest country in Europe, if you look at the size, like the acres. Uh, but when you look at the population, we're not that large, maybe. We have like 10.5 million inhabitants. So we have quite a low uh, population density, uh, around 25 inhabitants per square kilometer. Our capital's, capital city is Stockholm. It's situated here in the East Coast. Uh, I currently live in Gothenburg, which is our second largest city in Sweden uh, on the West Coast. And then Kovde and our university is, you can say, in between these two cities, like in between Stockholm and Gothenburg, a little bit closer to Gothenburg. Uh, <clears throat> and if, when you look at the population, you can say that we are a little nation, but we like to think that we have quite a large impact. Uh, a lot of good inventions, I think, have come out from, from Sweden. Maybe you have heard about like Skype and Spotify, uh, um, the Zipper. Um, maybe since all of you are interested in maybe in biology, you have heard about the uh, Alfred Nobel and the Nobel Prize, Prize that are awarded from S Stockholm each year. And um, then just some slide about the education in Sweden. So. Almost all higher education is publicly funded. And in Sweden, we have around 30 state universities and university colleges. And studies in Sweden is free for all Swedes, but also for uh, other members of the European Union. Uh, and last year, we had around 40,000 international students that studied in Sweden. And of these, uh, around 70% were as uh, free movers and 30% uh, were as uh, exchange students. Uh, and mainly the students come from Germany, China, France, and India. But uh, I think that we have students from almost all over the world, actually. Um, yes, and then... Uh, like uh, Kip said, I have been teaching at the University of Skövde since uh, 2006, so for many years, and we have had a lot of uh, international students uh, in the programs that I'm teaching in. So I have met students from many different countries and from different study backgrounds and st different study cultures. And so I would say that there can be some main differences between the Swedish way of uh, studying and the experience that other students have. So I have just some slides about the differences that I have noticed uh, during the time I've been here at the university. So like in Sweden, it's really non-hierarchical, uh, the system here, which means that you call your teacher by their first name. So uh, you should not call me like professor, or doctor, or madam. Uh, the students should call me just by my first name, which is Maria. So the students found that one to be really strange uh, in the beginning uh, when they come here. But actually, we call us our vice chancellor just by her first name. Uh, I would say that it's only one person in Sweden you should not call by the first name, and that is actually the king. Uh, that one you need to call his majesty. So, but everybody else, it, it's just on first name basis. And then another part that can be different from the study cultures that the international students are used to is that in Sweden, self-studies is, is really a prominent part uh, of the studies. Uh, so it means that maybe you're not scheduled from, from eight to five every day in the week, um, but in, instead it means that you need to do a lot of studies uh, on your own. So it's really advisable also to make study groups among the students to help each other to understand the topics. 
Uh, and also here, lectures are not mandatory. So we don't take any attendance and there's not any like percentage of attendance that are written later on on your uh, degree sheet. And it's only the part that are actually examined that are mandatory to attend. Um, also in Sweden, we like to really stress the importance of critical thinking. So we usually encourage the students also to challenge uh, their teachers um, and also challenge what they are reading uh, and ask a lot of questions. Because we think that is the really good way of really understanding the topic and really understand what source you can trust or not. <clears throat> um, another really important thing is the group work. Um, and I will tell you in the course that I will tell you more about later, um, the course is actually performed as a project as a group work also. So we we'll really try to train the student to be able to work uh, good in a group uh, and get that kind of experience. Um, another thing that is really important, I think, uh, in Sweden is that everybody should um, be able to have equal study conditions. So it means that provide, we provide a lot of study support and adaptations to students with uh, disabilities. So for instance, if you have maybe dyslexia, ADHD or autism, it should not stop you from being able to, to study at the university and get a degree. So uh, examples of some study support that we can provide is for instance, that we can offer maybe audiobooks. Um, you can have oral examinations instead of written examinations. You can maybe have somebody that take lecture notes for you, or you can have also maybe extended time for examinations. But it, it really depends on, on what problems you are start struggling with also. Um, <clears throat> another maybe difference, I know that in, in some uh, countries, it's uh, really important like your summarized grade of your degree uh, in, in Sweden in general and in Kovde we don't have that kind of system so it means that we have no GPA or grade description that you will get uh, on your degree certificate and I would say like in general in Sweden grades are maybe not as important as it is uh, as in other countries and um, you know I have been uh, as a referee for students applying for PhD student positions and applying for different jobs. And I would say that the main importance and um, that um, the employee wants to know about the, the previous students is how well maybe they are functioning in a group, how, how well they can cooperate with other people, how flexible they are, how independent they can work. Um, these more the soft skills, I, I would say, are much more important in, in Sweden than actually the degree that you will get on different courses. Um, and then the last thing <clears throat> in Sweden, it's super important to be on time. Um, so actually, when we have labs that starts at 815 in the morning, it means that the door closes at 815. And if you come at 816, it means that you will not be able to enter the lab. So it means that if you have not entered the lab, uh, you will not pass the, the lab. And if you have not passed the lab, you have not passed the course. So you see, it's super important uh, to be on time in Sweden. And especially for, I would say, for our laboratory sessions, because in the morning, we always go through the safety uh, instructions and the safety work that needs to be performed. So. That's why we closed the door at 8.15. Um, yes, and then just some short facts about um, the University of Kovde. So we are uh, quite a small university. We have like 11,000 students, 550 people in the staff. We all offer around 60 study programs. I would say it's an innovative and cross-disciplinary uh, university. Like I said, we're quite a small university, but we have a lot of good collaboration with the industry. Uh, so also the, the education and the research that we have is quite applied, I, I would say also. Uh, we offer around 25 programs fully taught in English. I teach on, on both bachelor's and master programs that we offer in English. Uh, I will inform you a little bit more later. Uh, and we have international agreements with over 130 universities. 
and actually you can see we have we are welcoming more international students than we are sending out uh, exchange students <clears throat> and now <clears throat> i will more focus on uh, this specific course that we are offering for our bachelor's uh, program so it's called molecular biodesign 2 uh, it runs for uh, 20 weeks and the study pace is for 50% uh, and the students that attend this course are uh, either maybe third year bachelor students or it's also offered for our exchange students. And in order to study this course, you need to have passed uh, the molecular biodesign one and molecular genetics two courses. Um, and this is just the outline of our bachelor's program in molecular biodesign. As you can see in year one, they are studying like general chemistry, cell biology, microbiology, genetics, etc. cetera. Um, in the second year, uh, they need to study this molecular genetics, molecular by design. These were the prerequisites to be able to start this course, molecular by design two. And then in par parallel, you can see that, um, just wait, I need to move. They are studying this course, uh, entrepreneurship and project management. And these courses are the last courses they are studying before they will perform their thesis project in bioscience. So it means that in this course, we are trying really to train the students uh, to be as independent as possible so that they will be able to perform their thesis work in a very good way. Um, and they are the students are doing many things in this course, but the main thing is to perform uh, and plan for a CRISPR-Cas9 experiment. So in the beginning of the course, this is actually all the information that the students uh, are given. Uh, so I will just read it for you. So it says that the group assignment is to generate a mutant phenotype in the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, by using the CRISPR-Cas9 technique. It's now up to you to decide which mutation you wish to introduce, but the mutation must be visible by the naked eye or by a regular microscope. And then the students should not insert the CRISPR construct in the flies by themselves. Instead, they will send the vector construct to another lab that will do the injection for you. Uh, and then after uh, the students have received the injected flies, or usually they are comes as larvae, they need to breed them and sequence this DNA to analyze uh, the mutation. So this is actually all the information that the students uh, will receive uh, in the beginning of the course. Uh, then it's up to them to really try to find out more information about this technique, more information about the fruit fly, what mutation they want to go for, uh, and find all the protocols by themselves also. Uh, and before the laboratory work starts, they have four supervised meetings with me where they can ask me questions and I can guide and help you them during the way. But uh, if we look, I have just some brief information about uh, CRISPR-Cas9 and how it works. Um, you can say that it's like genetic scissors, um, this technique that can be used to change the DNA of, for instance, animals, plants, and microorganisms. And it has an extremely high uh, precision, actually. And in 2020, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dodna were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the discovery uh, of this technique. And you can say that it can be used to quickly and effectively edit the genes by precisely cutting the DNA at a specific location and then letting the natural DNA repair process uh, take over. Uh, so <clears throat> if we go back to the, the project that the students should perform in this course, Molecular by Design 2, what they first need to think about is that they need to decide what gene they want to mutate in the flies. Because there are many different known mutations in, in the fruit fly. The changes may be the eye color, uh, the body color, or the wing shape uh, of the flies. So first they need to decide which mutation they, they should go for. And then they need to find out more about the inheritance uh, of that gene they want to then knock out, so to create the mutant phenotype. 
Um, so then here, um, they need to know if the gene is maybe um, recessive or if it's dominant, if it's lethal or if it's sex linked. Uh, and also they need to maybe know how many exons does it contain and what is the sequence of this gene. So all this information they need to, to find uh, on their own. Um, then in order for the CRISPR-Cas9 to be able to do the cutting, they need to find a good target sequence in the gene they want to disrupt, in the gene they want to make unfunctional. So let's say now that um, a group has decided on this um, white gene. So meaning that the fruit fly originally has the red eyes, but the gene wants to make this uh, into white eyes. So it means that they need to mutate and make this white gene unfunctional. They want to knock it out. So then they need to find a target where they will do the, the cut in this white gene. So then they can use specific bioinformatic tools. There are many different that you can, can use in order to find this uh, target. Uh, also, it's totally up to the student to find and decide which target they uh, or which tool they want to use for this. And then, of course, they need to make sure that the target is situated in an axon, so it should have an effect on the protein because you want to make the protein unfunctional. Um, then they also need to consider the off-target effects, so it, it doesn't find and cut in other places as well, because you only want to affect your uh, white gene. You don't want to make anything more to mutate in, in your fly. Um, and then also for this Cas9 to be able to work and to be able to, to cut in the place where you want, um, you need to have your target sequence followed by a PUM sequence a specific three nucleotides uh, basis. Um, so <clears throat> also in order then for this uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, to work, you need to have this guide RNA. This um, will guide the Cas, uh, Cas9 to cut in the right position uh, in the cell. Um, and Let's say in this picture here, you have uh, like the chromosome of the fruit fly, the DNA here. Let's say that this part here belongs to this white gene that you want to knock out, make unfunctional. And then you have your target here in, in green, in this white gene. So then in order for the Cas9 to know where to cut in your target, you design like a guide RNA that will bind and be complementary to the target in the white gene. And then the Cas9 uh, can find it here and make uh, the cut. So the Cas9 enzyme forms a complex with the guide RNA and cuts the DNA at the targeted location. So it creates this double strand breaks in the DNA. And then of course, uh, the cell doesn't want to have a lot of cuts in its DNA, so it wants to repair it. And it does that by using its own repair mechanism. So you're taking advantage uh, of this. And then uh, the repair system can have two different pathways um, that you can select or, or try to go for. So either you have this non-homologous end joining or the NHA pathway. Uh, and in that way, you don't have to add any um, target or, or any donor DNA. It's only enough with the, the guide RNA. So when the cell wants to put back these two cut ends back together, the cell um, usually creates a lot of insertions and deletions in the, the part where they want to uh, do the repairing. Um, but you have no control over what kind of de insertions or de deletions that will occur. So it's really random. But you're hoping for that it can lead to a frame shift mutation. So that from that point on, the amino acids will be totally changed so that your, your protein will be unfunctional and you will get this uh, white eyes instead. So that is one system or you can go for. Then you have also this other pathway, which is the homology directed repair or the HDR. That one requires that you also add like a donor DNA, like as a template. Uh, and your template must have then also like a homologous part um, 
um, DNA sequences that are homology to the parts that are surrounding the cut uh, area. Uh, but and in that way, your donor DNA, the part that you have added, will then be introduced to the DNA in the cut site. So by that way, you have more control over the specific mutation that will occur because specific pieces of DNA can either be added or deleted. So you have more control over it. But uh, the disadvantage with this homology direct repair that it, it is less efficient than the non-homologous and joining uh, system. So also uh, during this course, the students needs to uh, discuss the advantages and disadvantages with these two methods uh, or these two different pathways. Should they go for the NHE or the HDR? Um, what are the benefits? What are the purpose of their experiments uh, and so on? And then they need to uh, like decide. Um, and then the next step uh, for the students will be to create this guide RNA so that um, the Cas9 can do the cut in the gene that they have wanting to target and want to make unfunctional. So then we're using a vector-based system for that. And then the vector we're using are uh, having this U6 promoter uh, coupled with this guide RNA. But the guide RNA is not complete. It only contains the general things uh, of the guide RNA, like this scaffold part that is, is needed to hold the Cas9 in, in place and do the cutting. Uh, but then you can see here that after the promoter and before this blue part, which is the rest of the guide RNA, there are two uh, specific restriction sites for BBS1. So it means that if you cut your vector with BBS1, you just open the vector up and then you have a chance to uh, insert your really specific target um, that will then target the gene that you want to mutate and make unfunctional. Uh, so these are the features of the vector together that it has also an ampicillin resistant gene, so it can create um, or you can use it for selection in bacteria later on also. Um, so, <clears throat> like I said, um, then the students need to find this target. I said that there are different tools, bioinformatic tools, that you can use in order to find this target. When they have the target, they can design uh, the oligos that are needed to create their guide RNA. Um, and the oligos needs to be designed so that they come um, or you add the overhangs and uh, that will match uh, the BBS1 uh, restriction site cut uh, in the vector. Uh, so then the student needs to design all of these uh, oligos uh, by themselves. Uh, I will check them, but then if they look okay, uh, I will order them. So also that the students are really working with the things that they have uh, designed on their own uh, also. Uh, and then the oligos come, the student mix them, um, raise the temperature and lower it uh, slowly back together again so that the two oligos will anneal, uh, creating this uh, double-stranded short fragment uh, with these overhangs that will match the BBS1 uh, digested vector. Uh, and then they need to then digest uh, the vector uh, with the BBS1. Uh, and also here, the student needs to know uh, everything, uh, what they will use and set up the, all their reactions and plan for that by themselves. And we also uh, encourage them to really try to optimize also this reaction, trying to use maybe different tubes with different amounts also um, to make sure that they are uh, successful. Uh, then they check their digestion with gel electrophoresis. And then they purify their digested vector from the gel by using this Kia, uh, quick gel extraction kit. Uh, and then I think the most tricky part or most sensitive part in this experiment comes. Uh, it's when you should ligate your annealed oligos to the digested vector. Uh, also here, the student needs to plan and think about that uh, also and think also about the ratios because now you have like a small um, 
insert here a small part it's like only like 20 nucleotides in size and then you want to ligate it into a vector that has really a, a large size so they ne really need to consider the different sizes and think about the ratios of um, the vector versus the insert they should be using and do also here they can use different uh, like tools uh, in order for to do this kind of calculations and also they should do multiple maybe ligations also to increase the chance of being successful. Um, then when they have their um, recombinant vector with their insert, they should transform it into competent E. coli cells, then plate them on selective uh, plates containing um, uh, ampicillin. Um, also here, of course, you need to include a lot of different uh, controls. Also, that one is totally up to the students to plan for, um, to see how many controls they need, how many plates should they spread and so on, uh, because they will also prepare all the, all the plates and all the chemicals, all the buffers by themselves. So they also need to know how much they should prepare of everything. And each group should be making only for their group. Um, and I don't know if I told you, but in each group in this project, there are three to four students in each of these groups, study groups. Um, and then they grow their bacterial colonies with hopefully with their vector overnight um, uh, in liquid uh, LB media uh, broth. Uh, and then also they need to, of course, take multiple uh, colonies. They should also decide on their own how many colonies they should pick and, and grow further on. Uh, and then the next day they isolate um, the plasmid DNA uh, and then to make sure that the vector has not just self-ligated but it actually contains uh, your target sequence, your insert, they need to perform then also Sange sequencing to make sure that they have been successful in their, in their ligation and, and cloning work. Uh, and then um, the students needs to then also analyze uh, the sequencing um, results to really confirm that the insert of the target is actually in the vector. Um, and then, of course, some years, uh, none of the students were actually successful uh, in putting in um, their target into the vector. And in some years, uh, all the students and all the groups were successful. So it can really vary. Um, but I would say also that in this type of course, um, the grade of the student is not at all related to the results that the students will get. The most important and the grade will reflect on how well you have planned for your work and how uh, well you're performing, not at all based on the results actually that you will get. Uh, because also with this cloning, you never know if you will be successful or not. Uh, cannot uh, know also so um, and then let's say that the student were able to put in their target into the the vector and they got the right sequence and um, then they should send it for micro injection uh, and then the student also need to find where can this be sent uh, who has this kind of facility in europe and what are the requirements of my dna for sending it because also it's really important that your DNA has been eluted in water and not maybe EB buffer or TE buffer because that could kill the embryos uh, of the flies. So it's really important that the student know that so they have eluted their DNA in, in water. Um, <clears throat> and then um, this uh, their construct that they have produced now the students are then injected to the embryos of flies that are actually already expressing the Cas9 uh, enzyme. So then you have both the Cas9 and the guide RNA uh, into the flies that are needed for this kind of CRISPR um, technique to work. And then really depending on, on time also, um, the larvae are returned and then the student should breed and screen uh, the flies for the mutation. Uh, and then also they should plan for how the gene can be sequenced in order to analyze the mutation. Let's see that you see some flies that has the mutation that you are uh, looking for, let's say the, the white eyes. Uh, then you want to see actually what has happened at the molecular level in this white gene to cause this kind of uh, uh, phenotype. 
But sometimes we don't get there either because uh, sometimes it can take a really long time to get the flies back. And we are quite limited with the time uh, of the course also. So this was just an example of some parts that we're doing in, in this course and some of the experience uh, we have so far. Uh, usually the course is highly appreciated by the students, but there are always some challenges. And I think the main one is this group work, because um, in this course, uh, there can be students from all over the world, because it's an international program. Uh, so it um, can be students from Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, and of course also Sweden, uh, mixed. So they have many different cultures um, and, and ambition levels also. Some students are really aiming for an A and some students are really content if they will receive a D. So that always can uh, make a lot of conflicts uh, in the group. Um, from this year, we have tried to introduce two different workshops that are like three hours uh, each, where the students should discuss like group, group dynamics, group conflicts, and they make also group contracts in order to like, improve to and reduce the the conflicts uh, that can maybe occur in these groups uh, and another challenge is of course also like i said it's maybe usually not enough time to get the flies back in time before the end of the course but also we consider that the main purpose with this course is what i told you previously it's that the student will learn how to work in groups and really get the training of that one and also the planning of the laboratory work that they need to do, because they need to find all the material, all the protocols by themselves uh, also. Uh, and I think that is um, really an, an important part that they will learn uh, during this course. And also some other thing that I also want to stress and that we do in the, also in this course is to discuss the ethics uh, concerning this uh, technique, the CRISPR-Cas9 technique uh, as well. Okay, yes, so that was the, the project that we're doing for the bachelor students. Now I will also just really briefly go through my uh, research uh, project. So like all over the world, soil-borne plant pathogens like bacteria, fungi, and nematodes, they can cause serious diseases in crops that can lead to really high yield losses. Uh, and in Sweden, there's an increased need of producing more oilseed rape, potato peas, and sugar sugar beets, beets. Um, however, this can be limited by the soil-borne plant pathogens causing a lot of uh, diseases. And one of the crops that I'm mainly working with uh, is oilseed rape. So I don't know if you have any experience or, or growing that one, maybe not that much in, in Indonesia, but in Sweden, it's, really, it's a really common crop. Uh, and it actually produces really small um, black seeds, and these seeds are dried and then pressed into rapeseed oil. And the rapeseed oil is the third largest source of plant derived oil in the world, and it's also considered to be really healthy. And in the European Union, about 25% of the rapeseed oil is used for food, like human consumption. And then 75% is used for industrial use, so for the production of biodiesel. And in Stockholm, almost half of all the buses that are running in Stockholm uh, um, are actually running on this biodiesel produced from rapeseed oil. Uh, and the acres in Sweden has really doubled and the price now for the rapeseed uh, is really, really high. But of course, uh, it has then some limitations if you want to grow this uh, even further. And it has that it can get some really serious diseases. And one of them is this sclerotinia stem rot that I'm uh, working with. And this disease is called by this fungi, uh, sclerotinia sclerotiorum, which causes uh, this disease. Uh, and actually this fungi can be found all over the world and it has more than 400 different hosts. Um, and the fungi can actually survive in the soil as uh, sclerotia, which is this really uh, tough uh, resting structures, these black ones, um, and it can survive in the soil for up to 10 years. And then when the soil temperature is right and the humidity is also right, it can start grow 
and create this kind of mushroom-like structures called uh, apothecia, and then they can release uh, a lot of spores. And then these spores can be spread by the wind, and then they can land on the petals and the leaves of the rapeseed plant. And then also, if the conditions are correct, they can start infecting the stem uh, of the rapeseed and then cause a lot of yield losses, up to 50%. Uh, but also, it can really affect the oil content in the seeds. Because remember, since it's um, infecting the stem, it means that it prevents the transportation of water and nutrients throughout uh, the plant. But is there not something that you can do in order to get rid of this uh, fungi and this disease? Uh, yes, there is. You can spray with fungicide, uh, you know, really harsh chemicals that will kill the fungi. However, it's quite difficult to know if the farmer, if he should spray or not, because um, he needs to spray before the symptoms arise, so, because the fungicide has no effect on an already established fungal infection. So it means that he cannot go out in the field and see that, aha, now I have some infection here and then I spray. No, because then it's too late. So he needs to take that decision earlier. And then nowadays, since the... Uh, price is so high for this rapeseed, it means that a lot of farmers, they just spray, even though if they think that this disease will be there or not. Um, and of course, this can have some drawbacks. Uh, of course, it can reduce the profit for the farmer, uh, because it, it um, he needs to buy this fungicide, the chemical, he needs to pay for somebody to, to, to spray it in the field. Uh, when he is driving also through the field, he's destroying some of his crops as well. But the main drawback is, of course, that it has a negative impact on the environment. So it means that you're releasing a lot of harsh chemicals into the environment, even though maybe it's not needed. So you, the farmers are just doing that as a, like a precaution to be, make sure. Uh, and of course, if you're using a lot of these um, chemicals and these fungicides, um, a lot, it can lead to a developed uh, fungicide resistance uh, in this sclerotinia. So it means that you cannot use this, this fungicide um, in the future. Um, so we believe that it's really important that um, there's an assessment uh, of the need to use fungicide treatment uh, and that you carry out that always before you should do the spraying. Um, and also, if the disease should be developed or not in the field, it depends on many different things. Uh, like I said, it needs the uh, moist condition in order to create this disease. So, of course, weather conditions are really important. Of course, also the, the fungi needs to be there or the spores needs to be there. Otherwise, there cannot be any disease causing uh, from this uh, fungi. Uh, and also a lot of other things are important in order to know if the disease will be there or not. So um, what we are uh, focusing in this project is trying to develop molecular techniques in order to find out if this fungi can be found in the field or not, and together with uh, other inputs as well, try to build a model and try to answer uh, to the farmer if he should spray his field or not. Um, and these molecular methods, they are obviously much more faster and reliable than conventional old methods where you just took some part of the plant and grow it on uh, some auger plates. So what we're doing is that we are setting up field trials um, in, in the rapeseed field, uh, some area that are not sprayed with fungicide. Uh, then we collect many different samples like leaf, petal, soil, and air sam samples from the field. Then we take these uh, samples back to the, the lab and we isolate the DNA. And then we use both uh, absolute quantification like QPCR and nanopore sequencing in order to detect and quantify the amount of this fungi in the field. And then later on in the season, we go back into the field again and the, assess the incidence of sclerotinia stem rot. So we check how, how much disease were there actually in the field. Uh, and these are just uh, some results from the spore trap, meaning that we have collected like air. <laughs> the air is sucked in and then lands on some tape. We take the uh, and then the tape for each day during like two months, uh, and then we extract the DNA from this 
tape samples. Um, and then we run qPCR to see if um, any spores uh, of this fungi was there. Uh, and then we connect it also to, together with uh, this uh, line here is the um, uh, temperature in the air. This is the relative humidity. Um, these bars here are rainfall precipitation. And then these black dots are the amount of qPCR, um, like how much of the fungi you can detect. And then you can correlate it. Aha, uh -huh, here you see the temperature goes down, then also there's no spore release in the air. The temperature goes up also after a little bit of rainfall, then it goes down. You have your highest peak here also when the temperature is around 15 degrees and after some rainfall as well. And then you can find out much more about this, this disease also. And in addition, uh, we have recently also started to use this nanopore sequencing. It's just this really small machine here um, where you load your DNA to, then you couple it to a laptop uh, and then it will do the sequencing in real time. Uh, then you compare your sequences to a database of known sequences, maybe from all the fungi. And then it can create this kind of um, picture uh, for you where you can see what kind of fungus do you have, what kind of classification, what kind of species is it also in order to see if the fungi is there in the field uh, or not. And since the small size, so the idea is that in the future, you can directly go and do this uh, in, in the field and let the farmers really know really fast what to do. So this is just a, like a summary uh, of the research. So it means that we collect a lot of uh, samples in the leaf. We go back to the lab, do the extraction of the DNA, analyze it by different methods. Uh, we also put in all the variables from uh, the climate data, maybe also consider some economical aspects. We go back in the field again and assess if the disease was there or not. We put it in all this into a computer model, um, do some machine learning and AI and outcomes a uh, decision for the farmer if he should spray his field uh, or not, like a decision support for him. Um, yes, and this is just like a funny picture. Usually in Sweden, uh, we find it to be really like picturesque and really nice in, in the spring when you have all these rapeseed fields uh, in bloom. But this is actually how it can, can look like when they have actually, <clears throat> when we need to go out back to the field and do their assessment uh, if the disease is there or not. They can be like really tall and really difficult to, to walk, walk through. Um, yes, and then just really some brief information about our school. And so it's the School of Bioscience, uh, our head, Diana, our deputy head, Selmina. Uh, in our like department, we are like 60 employees, uh, 600 full-time students, uh, like 10% are fee-paying, so outside of Europe. 20% uh, are on advanced level. Uh, when it comes to like budget, we have almost like 70% on education, 30% on research. Uh, and 50% of our research money are external research funding, so not from the government. Uh, we have four different um, research groups uh, within systems biology uh, in our uh, school. Infection biology, translational bioinformatics, ecological modeling, and cognitive neuroscience and philosophy. Uh, and I think we have maybe links also, so you can read more about these research groups as well. Uh, and then, like I said, we are a small university, so a lot of the researchers have a close collaboration with um, the industry. Uh, and we have like a collaboration platform also with our uh, partners. I think you can also find a link maybe later, so you can read more if you're interested uh, about these collaborations. Um, and these are the programs that we are offering uh, in our school. So these two bachelor's programs, uh, Molecular Biodesign and Molecular Bioinformatics, are both offered in English, uh, fully in English. Uh, then we have three other master's uh, or bachelor's programs that are in Ecology and Sustainable Development, neuro Neuropsychology and Consciousness Studies, and then applied positive psychology. Uh, 
and those are given in Swedish. They can contain courses in English uh, for our exchange students, but not fully in English. Then all our master's programs are given in, in English. So we have one in cognitive neuroscience, mind and brain. And then we have in infection biology, molecular biotechnology, biomarkers in molecular medicine, bioinformatics, uh, systems biology with specialization in bioinformatics, and then molecular uh, ecology also. Um, and then just really briefly here, you can see just the outline of uh, some of our master's, two-year master's program. Um, so um, <clears throat> some programs are quite similar. It's only like some program-specific courses that are varying. Um, but then in the first semester, they are studying like bioinformatics, some bioinforma uh, bioinformatics and some biostatistics, some experimental methods and design, uh, some then program specific course. Uh, in the following semester, they are mainly studying uh, like how they can analyze biological data using uh, computers. Um, and then the third semester is all about this sequencing and mainly about this also nanopore sequencing, this next generation sequencing and how you can analyze those kinds of data. Uh, and then you finish off with your master's degree uh, project. Yes, so um, that was my presentation. Uh, I don't know if I stuck to the time, but I'm uh, really... Uh, happy to any answer any questions that uh, uh, you might. Thanks, Maria, for the nice presentation. That was very insightful and enlightening. So uh, now we are opening Q and A session. There's actually has been a question in the in the chat room. Uh, the question is came from Sofia Nur Aziza. Sofia is asking that. Uh, according to your website, there are several requirements to apply to the master degree. For example, we have to have our bachelor degree in specific fields like microbiology, biochemistry, or etc. But her BS, her bachelor degree is in marine science, but he took microbiology, biochem, and biotech courses in her final year. So she wanted to ask. Uh, is it possible for her to apply for a master's degree in molecular biotechnology in Skofde University? Thanks. Uh, yes, because uh, the thing we are saying that uh, you have to have a degree like in biology and then we give some examples just like um, biochemistry, microbiology, etc. But you can also have like a medical degree. And what we are looking at, um, because since I'm the uh, program director, so first uh, your degree is checked centrally in Sweden so that you fulfill that you have like a bachelor's degree that is equivalent to our bachelor's degree. But then me as a, a program director will then specifically look at the different courses that you have studied during your degree. So if you have then studied relevant courses like uh, maybe genetics, microbiology, these things, so then we will consider it and then you will be able to be admitted, even though you don't have specifically the requirements that we are writing as examples in our um, in the requirements for the master's program. So I would encourage you to apply, definitely. That's very nice. Uh, so there is a precipitated question coming from Rizki Chandra. Uh, he or she is asking, stem cell is the promising future therapy, and he or she wanted to research more advanced about it. Uh, did Skofde facilitate uh, stem cell research or? Uh, oh. Yes, research. We have some, um, especially in the field uh, of bioinformatics, a really good uh, researcher, um, in, more in bioinformatics that are doing work with stem cells. We don't have the facility in our lab to do that kind of laboratory work with stem cells, but I know that they have collaboration with companies like in, in Gothenburg. So you, if that kind of work is needed, then you can use the facilities of uh, the companies. But then, of course, it will not be on 
maybe a course based, uh, then maybe it will be for your maybe thesis work or for, for PhD students. Hmm. I hope that answered the question for Risky Chandra. And then there is other question coming from Fajar Hussain. He asked that uh, he wanted to develop his ability to learn more about how to design herbal medicine from natural resources, such as medicinal mushroom. <laughs> Any comment on it? <laughs> uh, I don't know that much about <laughs> medicinal um, mushrooms. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> nowadays, uh, the drugs that we're using and the drugs that a lot of these, um, what do you say, uh, drug companies, famous ones, a lot of uh, their knowledge is based on what the, the, the nature in itself has produced uh, previously. Mm -hmm. So, um, of, of course, just find out more and, and see if that is something that could be yeah, done, even though I don't know that much about it. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh... I mean, the presentation is very interesting, actually, because Sweden is one of the big, the big country of the Europe, but somehow the population is quite small. Mm -hmm. So the population density is quite small, also. So I just kind of wonder, uh, how was the 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 security, the safety to to be living in Sweden? I mean, like with such. Uh, small density of population is that is that something to be wary of uh no <laughs> i think that if you have much dense population then maybe you should be can maybe more worried about uh, the safety usually uh, i think the most effect and the students what they feel when they come to especially cover there for studies they feel it to be really safe uh maybe Sometimes a little bit too quiet, maybe in the the maybe in the night or afternoon, especially during our winter time. In the summertime, then you know the summer almost never sets, uh, and a lot of people, as soon as it's nice weather in Sweden, everybody goes out and uh, enjoys to sit out and these things. But in the winter time, it can be quite dark, uh, and not that you should feel. Uh, Scared because usually it's really really safe and low crime uh, in like Kovda uh, and in Sweden I think in general but um, it can feel maybe that you are not meeting a lot of people because sometimes when it's uh, cold and, and dark uh, during in Sweden um, during the winter time people like to stay in uh, light a lot of candles and um, spend time with family and friends maybe more than going out on the town. Okay. That was, that was like me. Uh, maybe I need to re-summarize the presentation that was given by Maria to give her a, a bit of time to drink or probably do something else. I mean, she's been talking for 30 minutes, probably need to drink. So Maria has already explained to us about the living condition in Sweden. Sweden is a very big country with very uh, quite small population, so the density of population is quite small, but um, as Maria said before, that the security and safety of the, the country, uh, you can rely on it. And then uh, there are several things that Maria has explained before. Uh, one thing is the medicine course, number two. I mean, it's very insightful because uh, the course is uh, doing doing an experimental thing using CRISPR, which is we found we in biotech field, CRISPR is such a such a such a new thing, such some such uh, disrupting things in tech we call uh, that you can actually do genome editing in such an easy easy way. And they are using a fruit flies as their uh, organism model. Uh, actually I've done some some laboratory experiment on fruit flies back in bachelor's degree, but mostly we just do uh, we just do some breeding to find the mutant. But in scope, they apparently they are using the CRISPR just time 
methods to get the mutant. That is quite quite uh, exciting. Uh, so Maria, there are, there are two questions from Grass first. She asked about uh, the molecular biotechnology program. There are two programs, the one year and two years program. Is there any difference of those besides the, the duration? Um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe. Uh, is it okay if I share my screen again? Sure. Uh, um, because that is also a question I get uh, quite a lot. Um, so if we go back to this slide here, um, here. So here you see uh, the outline for our two-year master's program in molecular biotechnology. And then you see here, the first semester you will study data analysis for life science. You will study bioinformatic concepts and methods. And then you will study experimental methods and design in bioscience. Uh, and then here it will be the program specific course. So here it will be the molecular biotechnology uh, course here, if you are interested in the molecular biotechnology program. So then for the one year program, it means that you will study exactly the same courses here in the first semester as the two year master's program. But then in semester two, here you will do your thesis project, your master's degree project. And it will not be in systems biology, which is uh, the degree project you will do in the two year master's. Instead, it will be in bioscience. So it means that it will be here you can do it more like experimental um, work uh, only. Uh, and then after you have finished your degree, you will get a master of science uh, for 60 credits with a major in bioscience. Um, and then if you study the two year masters, like I said, then you will learn much more about how to use the computers and bioinformatics tools uh, in order to analyze biological data and maybe specifically large biological data because nowadays with these all the new techniques that are coming a lot of biological data are being uh, analyzed uh, not analyzed by but produced with these sequencing all these sequencing techniques that are quite inexpensive and can produce a, a lot of different data but uh, and Maybe there are a lot of people who knows how to produce this biological data, but not that many who actually knows really well how to analyze all this data and what to do with all this data. Um, so that is actually what you will learn during the two year master's program. Um, and then also you have also your thesis project will be also a little bit longer. It will be for running for 30 weeks. Um, the one year master's program, then you will do a degree project that is only for 20 weeks uh, so it's different uh, and then if you're thinking that maybe you want to go for maybe a phd or some other kind of job afterwards um, then in sweden if you want to try to find a um, phd student position in sweden then a one-year master's degree is enough you will fulfill the requirements in order to be able to start uh, phd studies However, I would say that now in Sweden, um, most students actually go for a two-year master's degree. So it means that if you're applying for a position, you're also competing against other maybe students that have a two-year master's uh, and you only have maybe a one-year master's. So I don't say that um, it's not possible to get maybe a PhD position after one year master's degree. I think it totally depends on the recommendation that you will get after you from your supervisor during your thesis work. Um, and then also what have you learned during your thesis and studies also. But I know that maybe in other countries, uh, maybe for instance in, in Germany, then they are actually requiring a two-year master's degree in order to fulfill the requirements to go for a PhD student position. If you're looking for other kinds of jobs, um, the students from our one-year master's program, they got uh, really good jobs, I think, uh, after just like a one-year degree uh, as well. 
even after just the three three year bachelors they also got i think uh, good jobs but it's more than maybe companies uh, also then i guess astrazeneca a lot of students have got jobs there um yeah so that is maybe the difference between the one year and two year and uh, i would also say since the programs are really uh, similar it's similar the first whole semester is similar so you have the chance of actually changing from the different uh, programs um, also okay uh, there is another question from Susi Kita Indria there are two questions from her so Will there be a session where the student depends their understanding about the standardized lab procedures, since it may be very for international students from different backgrounds? The second question is, for students interested in microbiology slash genetics, environmental science field, which course will be more suitable, bioinformatics or molecular biodesign? <clears throat> Okay, yes, so um, of course, um, since we have had international students for quite some time, we know that uh, from experience that it's um, the student comes with different uh, uh, background and study culture when they come to us. So of course, also we need to um, adapt and make sure that everybody will be able to, to follow and adapt to our like Swedish system. So it means like, for instance, sometimes we have students that have not that good, maybe a uh, practical background. Maybe they don't have a lot of laboratory facilities in, in their country, but they know a lot of maybe theoretical knowledge. Um, and we, we know that, that we have students that have like different knowledge since they come from so many different countries all over the world. So it means that we need to start for instance, the laboratory work, we always have like uh, laboratory introductions where we just teach all the students about the, the safety guidelines that we have here in, in Kovda, really teach them everything, teach just how to, to pipe it, how to work with all the machines. So we start at really like a basic level so that everybody should be able to follow. And then we try to, yeah move quite fast and, and have a lot of focus on the things that we know that some students struggle with that can come from different um, backgrounds. And so that one, I don't think uh, should be like um, any problem because everybody has uh, like advantages and disadvantages and what they know more about and what they maybe need some more um, help and support with from uh, us as teachers also. So maybe that was the first question. Now I don't remember the, the last one. Uh, the, next. the second question is that for students interested in microbiology slash genetics mm. and environmental science field, which course will be more suitable? Um, yeah, um, if you're talking about the master's program, then I think the infection biology program would be most interesting for you. Uh, if you're talking about a bachelor's program, um, then I would say it would be the molecular biodesign program if you want to still do some experimental work and work with like microorganisms. And the bioinformatics bachelor's program is really much more into programming and computers. Yeah. I hope that answered the questions. Uh, we move on to the next question submitted by Ahmad Zainuddin. How do you think adopting the biodesign in leveraging the capacity of small industries? Uh, yeah, I think this um, techniques, especially now, like you said, uh, with the CRISPR, you know, it's so precise. And I think also this technique is quite easy um, and cheap also. So I think it can have a huge effect on, on like small companies also. Um, you can do a lot with this CRISPR technique in a way. It's, uh, only your limit, uh, your imagination that can maybe set the limits, and also important thing, the ethics. What actually should you be doing, uh, and why? I think that is super important also uh, to consider with this uh, technique. 
Uh, but actually, I think it can have really a large impact on, on small industry, this kind of technique that is, like you said, so precise and so actually, in a way, easy to, to perform. Yeah, I think that's actually answered the question. Uh, is there anyone else? Oh, apparently there is another question from Fadel Asa. Uh, he has a question about bioinformatic course. Is there any specialty on a subject like medicine or just bioinformatics in general for the bioinformatic course? Hmm. Um, I think um, the bioinformatics, uh, the teachers in, uh, that are mainly teaching the bioinformatic courses and the researchers, they are more towards the medical field. I'm mm -hmm. quite uh, unique at the university that are more interested in the, <laughs> like the plant <laughs> uh, part, but otherwise, mainly the other um, research actually being performed in both bioinformatics and bioscience is more maybe towards also medicine, the, that connection. So I think uh, they are trying to develop uh, different uh, drugs and they are working also with different kinds of cancers and these things also. Uh, the bioinformatics uh, people. So really try to look at the, the university web if you're more interested. But it's more like uh, medical connected, for sure, the bioinformatics. Hmm. Okay. But the plan side of the bioinformatics, is there any? Mm -hmm. What did you say? Sorry. I mean, you mentioned that the bioinformatics course is more focused on medicine, but how about the plan? So is it oh. all sort of off? You know, you can use bioinformatics also within this, uh, the, the research with the plants, uh, but the just the research that we have here at our university also are not focused on that uh, field, oh. the medical field. Mm. So I hope that answered the question for Fadel. Uh, and then there is another question from uh, Luna Sinandang. She asked that, she trying to understand the principle and usage of software for molecular biodesign, along with example of its implementation. Can you mention specific softwares? Mm, can, can you take that question again? Sorry. Uh, she actually asking, uh, can you mention specific softwares for, uh -huh. for molecular so biodesign softwares, application? Uh, um... No, maybe I can tell you specific softwares, what the students are using for this CRISPR uh, construct in order to guide their or find their target. Then they are using like this um, chop chop or target finder. There are different um, tools that can be used, but you know, different softwares, there are like so many different softwares that you can use within the field of, of molecular by design. Uh, for instance, different softwares to uh, produce or design your your primers uh, to design uh, other things to analyze uh, your QPCA, qPCR data. I know that they are using a lot of this um, R, like uh, the programming language R, uh, a lot uh, in our master's uh, programs and also in the bioinformatics um, uh, bachelor's program. Uh, GeneX is a software they are using in order to analyze qPCR data, uh, for instance, also, but there are many, many, many different, yeah. Yeah, there is actual, right? I mean, like I also experienced using several softwares for designing in molecular design, but they're not like limited to some. You can find open source software, or some that already existed uh, by the by the machine, like uh, thermal or else. So we still have ten minutes. If yeah, uh, I can just like you said. You, usually, you can find a lot of good information in this. Um, you know, the big lab companies that we yes. that provide <laughs> chemicals and and uh, equipment for. <laughs> They usually have a lot of free softwares and a lot of good technical information. So you can usually get a lot of good information from uh, those kinds of sites, like Thermo, KIN, Biorad. Yeah. All. yeah, but they also come with uh, quite a price, especially for Indonesian students. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean... um, <laughs> 
uh, I think a lot of the, um, at least from our side, a lot of uh, information and softwares are usually free. Maybe sometimes you need to maybe sign up, but uh, yes. but usually it's it's free. Some they charge for, but most I think it, it's open. Uh, we still have around ten minutes to answer some questions. Uh, so maybe I need to ask some question. I was really very uh, find it very interesting about the rapeseed oil. Uh, like how how was the 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 I mean, what it's is is there any industry that actually support the research? Um, do you mean my research or? Yeah, the one that you just explained to us. Okay, uh, yeah, so the research I have done in close collaboration with, with companies, but they are not like like industrial companies. They are more mm -hmm. companies that, um, that give out advice to farmers, like they are like consultants. Um, and they are, it's it's like a company, but but they are not producing like anything. But they are. Oh, but they are yeah. actually a consultant in genetic or uh, no, environmental. No, no. Environmental. More like, um, yeah, you can say environmental, and then also more like, uh, like they are maybe plant pathology specialist and really mm. knowledgeable within the the different diseases that can affect the crops. Um, oh yeah, th these things, um, and then also I have had also collaboration with some lab companies and also some companies that produce this kind of. Um, I also worked with barley and like barley seeds. They're also like this fungi barley, that can infect yeah. the yeah the barley um, kernels uh, and then spread and cause the disease a lot. So they did the analysis. Um, uh, of these seeds uh, by just uh, like a manual method. They just treated it with harsh chemicals and then looked in the microscope. And then we were trying to develop a, a method how you can do that with the molecular techniques instead with having to spend that much time in and uh, working with harsh chemicals uh, instead. So that was also uh, a company that I had a uh, connection with. Uh, it is very interesting because I mean, like the field of agriculture and crop agriculture that is providing us food is actually a very big industry, I guess that's the way we say that. And like the demand for research that's actually uh, increasing the crop yield, increasing increasing the production is a very important one. It's just like a uh, uh, health industry, but it's providing food actually. <laughs> mm. Uh, so there is another question submitted by Jacqueline. Can you share if there is any global trend on biotechnologies nowadays? Uh, yeah, um, I would say now the global trend is <clears throat> like the small machine I was showing you, this small sequencing machine. Mm -hmm. I think that one is really that nowadays that you can sequence a lot of DNA, a lot of different organisms at the same time, really in a portable way and in a really fast way. I think that is really uh, the future. And then also, um, like I said, also, how can you analyze then um, all of this sequencing data? Uh, and I think it's in biotechnology in many different fields within uh, agriculture, but also within um, more medicine um, that you in the future will do a lot more of this sequencing and then trying to now find out uh, what it means and what you can use this for and how you can analyze it. I think that is really the, the future in biotechnology. Yeah. Uh... There is another one last question in the chat box by Anonymous. Uh, what do you think about the difference between master by research and master by coursework? Uh, and then the second question is, do you have any suggestion about how to choose the most suitable for us, suitable course? Um, 
um, and no, these things with uh, research or or course based, um, I didn't really understand. Um, uh, we usually um, the master's programs that we offer it, it's course based, but in the courses we apply a lot of different also research and try to have it like research connected. Uh, what we're doing, so we don't have like. Uh, one masters that are more research focused and one more coast course focused. Uh, maybe I didn't, I don't fully understand, but we don't have that kind. So I didn't really understand that question. Um, um, and then the next question was uh, any suggestions for to choose uh, a program? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, then I think it's really important. What is your interest? What do you find is is, is interesting? Uh, that one I think is um, the main thing. Uh, you need to be interested within uh, the field because then your studies will be uh, much better uh, if you're interested in in something. Um, yeah, and uh, that's the main thing I think. Okay, I guess that is the. Last question that we can answer in this session. Uh, thanks to Maria. Hmm? Uh, and then, uh, thanks everybody. So if there is any question remain, and I swear you can fill the feedback the feedback form and submit the question if, the, if you need to be answered. And then the last thing is we invite everyone to join the the university for their for their sharing session that will be held in October. You can find the link on the chat box and also you need to register first so that you can attend. Uh, and then also uh, we remind you to join our webinar next week. Uh, the webinar is titled A Guide to Choosing Your Perfect University in Europe. It will be will be filled with Ariel Adi Mahavira and Nico Wijaya. Register yourself ASP. And then uh, I guess the last thing is closing remark from Maria. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for participating and if you have any questions um, and interested in studying at uh, our university, just feel free to, to contact me um, and I will try to guide you and help you. And I hope that you have found um, uh, it's maybe exciting and want to come maybe and, and study at our university and then you are warmly uh, welcome. Okay. Yes. I guess that's so all. That, yes, thank you, Maria. Yes. And uh, I have one one more thing. I need to remind you guys to sign up for the sharing session from Stop Day that will be held in October. And the other thing is that you can join several groups that are already already written in the chat box. Uh, thank you for all your attention. I hope you have a great weekend. And that's all for me. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.